small program. I've been with the Yurok Tribe a little over 10 years now. And um, this program that I'm going to highlight developed over the last 10 years and as a result of a lot of hard work from past and current staff. To, um, the development of this program is due to a lot of teamwork and I can't personally take responsible responsibility for but really try to uh, foster that, that team atmosphere to help uh, accomplish a lot of things. And, you know, I'm really uh, proud to be a part of this team and, um, you know, certainly benefit from our uh, previous environmental program director, Kevin Kernan, who worked with us from 2000 to 2008, that sort of had the vision and, the, um, um, you know, the fearless leader to um, help lay out the path for us, and we've, you know, followed in his footsteps and um, want to give him that acknowledgement. So um, today what I'd like to do is provide a brief introduction to the Klamath Basin and the Yurok Tribe and the Reservation. The, some major water quality and fisheries issues in the basin, and I like the major water quality monitoring projects that we've been working on recently. I want to talk about, I'll touch briefly on the tribe's water quality monitoring coordination efforts in the basin, and uh, touch briefly on our data management and sharing efforts to meet our EPA reporting requirements, and where our data is made available to those that are interested in it. So, uh, with that, I'm going to get started here. The uh, basin is a large basin. It's the third largest salmon producing stream on the West Coast, uh, not including Alaska and Canada, uh, third to the Columbia and Sacramento Rivers. Um, it's, it's challenging, um, you know, sort of jurisdictional issues that, that, that face water quality, uh, you know, regulations. Um, the Clown Basin begins in southwest Oregon and flows out to the Pacific Ocean and northwest California. Two state jurisdictions. Uh, both those states are in different EPA regions, and there are six fully recognized tribes that are within the basin. And, uh, Oregon, we have the Klamath tribes that are uh, up around Upper Klamath Lake, the Karuk tribe in the Mid Klamath, as well as the Quartz Valley Indian community. There's the Hopa tribe on the Trinity River, and then there's the Yurok tribe and the Resigini Rancheria inhabiting the lower Klamath River. Uh, a lot of different stakeholders in the upper basin. We have agriculture and hydropower. And um, there is also a commercial fishery in the ocean and there's also a tribal uh, tribal subsistence and commercial fishery in the lower river. There is timber um, resources in both states the entire basin. There's an amount of public lands. There's multiple national forest holdings and uh, BLM land holdings within the basin and portions of the, the Klamath River that have been listed, you know, part of the Wild and Scenic River um, Act and has um, been dead for recreational values. So, a map. Um, Basin and beginning in South Oregon, the Upper Klamath Lake, and then Upper Klamath Lake. That short portion is called Link River, and then, then uh, begins uh, Lake Iwana, uh, the Kino Reach, and then sort of below Kino is, is beginning of the Klamath River, which is over 230 river miles all the way to the mouth of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, uh, BOR has a uh, project, aerial project, There's also other air, agricultural projects that are up there that are not related to the Bureau of Reclamation's project. Um, some of the major tributaries, also what we have here is, is a series of dams. You have Link River Dam, Keno Dam, that are, uh, water division dams, and then you have Four hydroelectric facilities that Pacificor operates: one in Oregon, which is J.C. Boyle Dam, and three in California: Copco One and Two and Iron Gate Dam. The Iron Gate Dam is some major tributaries that are very important. You have the Shasta River, Scott River, the San River, and the Trinity River. And there are two dams on the Trinity: Trinity Dam and Lewiston Dam. 
The reservation is on the lower 46 River Miles down here, and then also a large reservation adjacent to that, which is the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation. I just want to zoom in on the on the dams. Uh, there's been a lot of attention in the last couple of years on the Klamath Hydroelectric Project and the potential dam removal. The dams that are slated for removal are J.C. Boyle. Code Dam 1 and 2 and Iron Gate Dam and meant Link Dam and Kino Dam will stay in place. Uh, just a brief update on where we are in dam removal process. Uh, in March 2012, the Secretary of Interior, Ken Salazar, will make a decision what they're calling the secretarial determination to decide whether or not dam removal is in the best interest of the American people. They promote the Klamath River fishery, and if they done for less than $450 million. Currently, the draft EIS, EIR is out for public review for that um, determination, and I believe comments are still, uh, the comment period is still open, and I think the deadline's um, December 18th. Uh, there's also another agreement that's linked to the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement, which is a dam removal agreement, and that is the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement. And agreement is to help um, help store the hat for the fish that will be entering the upper basin. A comprehensive restoration process that will uh, hopefully kickstart restoration activities before and after dam removal. That uh, legislation has been introduced into Congress recently and um, will be debated and potentially voted on here in the near future. So uh, at the bottom of the basin, as I had shown in those previous maps, is the Yurok Reservation. Typically, the Yurok have inhabited ancestral territory of over a million acres in size that included river habitats, mountain habitats, and coal habitats. The reservation is limited to surrounding the Klamath River, and it begins just upstream of the confluence with the Trinity River. It spans the Klamath River for approximately 46 river miles, a mile on each side, all over the mouth of the Pacific Ocean. Here's just our map uh, showing our, the land holding issue. The, the Euro Reservation is a classic checkerboard region in, in which there is a numerous landholders, um, both Indian Indian owners, both fee and trust status. Uh, fee stats just means that um, taxes are paid to the county in which those are um, in. And the Yurok Reservation is within Humboldt and Delmark counties, and that county line is approximately um, here where I have that laser pointer. The reservation is approximately 56,000 acres in size. Uh, the Yurok tribe has federal government holding. Um, 2,657 acres in trust for the Yurok tribe, and the tribe currently owns a little 30,000 acres in size that is within and outside the reservation boundaries. Just recently, the Yurok tribe received State Water Resource Control Board state revolving funds to purchase what we call Phase 1 from Green Diamond Resource Company to acquire a little over 22,000 acres. Plans are, are in this sort of dark green. What the tribe is doing is not limiting their land acquisition to just the reservation boundaries. They want to acquire lands within the res uh, ancestral territory and the subversed that are flowing into the reservation and into the Klamath River. These these obviously these tributary sub water are you know beginning outside the reservation boundaries and into and so they are using a watershed approach to acquire their lands and to help manage their lands. In turn, um, they are hoping to acquire Phase 2 from Green Diamond Resource Company, which is a little over 25,000 acres, and a large portion of that is in Blue Creek, which is the largest tributary to the Klamath River downstream of the Trinity River.
of the Yurok Tribe Environmental Program is to assess, protect, and restore tribal natural resources the exercise of high-quality scientific practices in coordination with the community, tribal departments, tribal council, and adjacent jurisdictions. Water Division is a division in the environmental program. There's six staff, including myself. Uh, there's three other specialists that work with me, and we have two wash AmeriCorps Watershed Stewards Project that serve 11-month terms with us. Um, so our major um, programs in that division is our water quality monitoring, assessment, and reporting program, and that's headed up by our water quality specialist, Scott Sennett. We have a hydrologic monitoring, assessment, and reporting program in the tributaries, and that's headed up by our tribal member, Micah Gibson, who is our hydrologic specialist. And within the last four years, we've developed a, a wetlands inventory assessment and protection program and that's headed up by our wetlands specialist, Bill Patterson. In 2004, the Yurok Tribe Council approved our, our quality control plan and our water pollution control ordinance for the Yurok Reservation, which established a regulatory program and requires government agencies who are implementing projects on the reservation the potential to impact water quality to a, for a water quality permit, which is very similar to a 401 certification process. Uh, we work closely with Caltrans and Humboldt and Delmark counties that are, um, you know, implementing transportation projects on the reservation to protect water quality. We have a watershed-based environmental education program in which we deliver environmental education curriculum to schools within the reservation boundaries. We have a Klamath Fish Health Assessment Team, and Klamath River TMDL, and, Blue, and Klamath River Blue Green Algae Work Groups. So um, we've been able to develop this program by using our base funding that we received from EPA, which is our Clean Water Act Section 16, which is for monitoring assessment and regulatory purposes. Um, these funds pay for our staff time, and we're able to pursue additional funds to meet additional needs. Funding we received in the past is EPA Clean Water Act Section 104B3 funds. And there's been in the past a uh, Bureau of Reclamation Klamath River funding source that we've been able to acquire in the past to do various things such as retrofit DSONs with new technology and to um, pay for lead analysis fees. We were um, successful in the last. Um, Six years receiving EPA wetlands program development funds to develop our wetlands program. And, uh, we just recently wrapped up a grant from um, the National Information Exchange Network or Exchange Network to help us um, report our data more efficiently. And most importantly, we have been the recipient of Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement or KHSA interim measure funds. Uh, measure number 15 uh, for water quality monitoring. Just a little bit of background on that. Uh, in the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement, there are numerous inner measures that were designed to deal with water quality and fisheries issues before dam removal occurred, which is uh, scheduled for 2020. And one of those inner measures, number 15, is Pacific Corps to provide $500,000 for water quality monitoring each year for the Klamath Basin for public health and comprehensive baseline monitoring purposes. Uh, the tribe receives a portion of that. Water quality monitoring is to gather baseline information to improve understanding of the health of the Klamath River as a whole and to help identify potential limiting factors or new studies that need to be undertaken to more precisely identify problems and solutions and are shared with other agencies and future water quality and fisheries management professionals. For monitoring is to establish baseline conditions across a wide array of water years to track long-term spatial and temporal trends through consistent comparable sites and methods and to the effects of various short-term and long-term management and regulatory actions throughout the basin. Um, the Europe tribe are river people, and they rely heavily on the resources of the Klamath River 
to uh, sustain their culture and to have a healthy culture. Uh, I heavily on the salmon runs for not only subsistence but for commercial purposes. And so um, we heavily on the other aquatic resources in the Klamath River, Stern, Lambay, Steelhead, Cold Cutthroat Trout, and Rain Trout, and um, historically Yulicon, to name a few. We also rely on the plants and animals that are also related to the Klamath River and, and a healthy environment. Some major issues that are guiding environmental programs, water quality monitoring activities, are based on that the Klamath River fish populations are in decline. Some species are extinct. It's on their endangered species at list. Klamath River is listed for instance of nutrients, dissolved oxygen, microcystin, and water temperature. TMDLs have already been completed, and the, the lower Klamath hydrolo hydrologic unit is listed as set and paired, and that TMDL is scheduled to occur um, later on, um, I think in like 2014. And this, there are, are also toxic blue-green algae blooms in hydroelectric project reservoirs that are 190 river miles upstream of the Pacific Ocean um, with reservation boundaries. and and the, um, that sends water downstream that contains toxic species and toxins. And this photo sort of illustrates that that issue of the toxic blue green algae. Um, the toxic species of concern, the may, the most dominant form is a cyanobacteria, um, Microcystis originosa, that, that toxin called microcystin, which is a hepatoxin or a liver toxin. Also can create other symptoms like flu-like symptoms and cause uh, skin irritations. So, um, in 2007, the Klamath River was listed or was posted for non-water contact from Cool Reservoir all the way to the mouth of the Pacific Ocean. And there was a flight that was done from an airplane of the Upper Basin, and we got some photographs of that of Cop Co Iron Gate Reservoirs that were taken on the 24th of September 2007. And and those arrows show the direction of water flow, sort of entering the reservoir habitat. These reservoirs provide um, the ideal habitat for these, this algae, which is still water habitat, warm water temperatures, and also the this, this water that is entering the reservoir is, is very nutrient rich and sort of like a perfect storm to provide the ideal habitat for the species that creates dense blooms in the summer months. This travels downstream through the turbines, and as you can see, um, there in September 25, 2007, the Wichapec, which is the upper portion of the reservation, approximately 150 miles downstream from Iron Gate Dam, the river uh, like antifreeze, and we had results that showed you know high levels of microcystis and toxins. And then a picture above was taken there, in sort of mid-September, in which you can see um, long green coloring of the estuary all the way out the chute to the mouth. And this period of time coincides when there is a tribal subsistence and commercial fishery, and so a, a large sport fishery on the Klamath River, but also it's during the time in which the Yakupa and Karuks are um, participating in ceremonies um, in villages adjacent to the Klamath River and require uh, the will participate in those ceremonies to um, attack with the Klamath River. And so these issues affect um, numerous beneficial uses, uh, one of which is the cultural beneficial use. So some of the major components of our Klamath River Water Quality Monitoring Assessment Program is grab sampling. And that was initiated in 2001 when Fish and Wildlife Service was in a through a flow study, they worked with Karuk and Yurok tribes to collect water samples and run data signs. Uh, starting in 2006, when Fish and Wildlife Service concluded that study, we picked up and now fully implement that pro uh, program. We collect for nutrients, phytoplankton, and microcystin. Uh, those are sampled twice a month, May through October, and monthly November through April. Three sites in the Klamath River. One site in the estuary and one site in Trinity River. 
We then are QAQC methods for surface water sampling using a churn sampler and certified labs. We have a U US EPA approved assurance plan and a sampling analysis plan for nutrients, phytoplankton, and paraphyton. Map of our monitoring locations. Again, we're monitoring upstream of the Trinity River confluence in the Klamath and Trinity River. We have a site downstream of the confluence to capture those that the Trinity River has on the Klamath River. The Trinity River is has better water quality than the Klamath. It's uh, nutrient rich and to be a cooler river, but it is still impaired for sediment. In the lower river, we have data on sites, grab sampling sites, the low river, and in the estuary. I have photos of the sites. This is the Klamath River, upstream Trinity River confluence. This is the, the river, up to the Klamath River confluence. This is the downstream of the confluence. And lower river site, this is the site that we have data on that, that is um, the USGS gate, Klamath River near Klamath. Uh, what we do at three of these sites is we have our data sons hooked up to uh, real-time hardware on the bank. So we establish these monitoring sites made through November and allows our data son data to be transmitted over the GO satellite network. And we have a um, LDS satellite receiver and Linux server that captures those results from space. And um, we've developed you know, complex scripts to be able to post that data over the World Wide Web. And I'll be in that link later on. Photo of our shot there, the Clown River Estuary, and we also operate a um, stage height recording estuary to document the effects on, on uh, tidal fluctuations in the estuary. We have our water samples analyzed for the various nutrient-related sites: total phosphorus, orthophosphorus, total nitrogen, nitrate plus nitrite, ammonia, chlorophyll and dissolved organic carbon, total and volatile suspended solids, alkalinity and turbidity. Um, this water samples are sent to different labs uh, due to this toxic blue-green algae issue we've been um, researching lately. Under though of a microcystis originosa cell colony under a compound microscope that was taken by Dr. Josh Strange, which is a tribal food biologist working for the tribe. Uh, we sampled off to um, for plankton species ID and cell counts to aquatic analysts. Total microcystin is analyzed via the ELISA method by EDA Region Lab in Richmond, California. And send a subsample of those samples to California Fish and Game Water Pollution Control Lab in Rancho Cordova for microcystin variants and anatoxin A. Another major component of our water quality study is uh, operating data sons for continuous real-time water quality monitoring. Initiated in 2001, we follow USGS standard procedures for continuous water quality monitors. Uh, sites in the Klamath, one in the Trinity. We're using ISI 6600 EDS um, and hooked up to design analysis loggers and transmitters. We're measuring 30 minute intervals from May through November for water temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, specific conductivity. We've out these data signs with optical probes, dissolved oxygen, and uh, blue green algae. Another component of our Klamath River study is benthic paraphyton sampling, which was initiated in 2004. And we're working with the state of California and uh, Pacific Corps water quality scientist uh, under contract. Mike Diaz, who's developing a water quality model uh, for the pre-licensing process. Uh, we've sort of adapted methods from a couple of problems, one of which is USGS methods for collecting algal samples. Uh, we have two in the clan, one in the Trinity, and samples off for benthic algae species ID and counts. Uh, it's all provided total density, total bio volume, and we're also sending off paraphyte and chlorophyllate samples to our neutral. Lab. So um, that's sort of what we're doing and some of the major things we're doing in the Klamath and Trinitarys. Um, we've also been hard in the tributaries to the Klamath River downstream of the Trinity River confluence. 
tributaries are basically the natural hatcheries for the fishery in which adult salmon come up to spawn and then juvenile fish uh, rear before they head out to the, clan, uh, to the Pacific Ocean. The majority of lands that drain into the lower Klamath River subbasin have been logged and are heavily eroded. Again, Klamath River fish populations are in decline. Some species are extinct. Others are on the Endangered Species Act list. The Yurok fisheries and our wild restoration programs are actively performing restoration activities, and the tribe is developing the reservation. A lot of Lower Blue Creek to kind of give you an idea of the landscape. Um, you know, heavily fragmented habitat. Uh, the majority of these lands have been lost twice, if not three times. A little primary forest remaining. Like a little bit of primary forest, you know, adjacent to a, a recently burned clear cut and wide um, landscape that just has multiple years of timber harvest. And you can see, you know, a road cutting across the landscape here. A um, note about this section of Blue Creek is that um, this area actually used to be in public land holdings. If you currently look at a USGS map and look about a mile upstream of the confluence with the Tr Klamath River, you can see an old uh, U.S. Forest Service campground. And, and there's also been a, a historically a USGS gauge on the on Blue Creek, which no longer exists. And what happened in the 1970s, uh, what folks around here call the second taking, uh, the expansion of National Park, in which um, the government did a huge land swap and paid private timber companies on the coast to reserve redwood forests to um, sacrifice, you know, large stands of dug fir and redwood inlet uh, adjacent to Blue Creek. So permanent hydrologic monitoring stations that have um, been established are in Tule Creek, Creek, and we have Turwer Creek, and one in McGarvey Creek. Um, we have gauging stations that um, take 15-minute measurements for a water stand and water temperature. We perform some flow measurements and collect suspended sediment samples during storm events. And in the spring and summer, collect macroinvertebrate samples. Our tribal fisheries program is active in these watersheds as well and perform numerous different types of fish population monitoring, doing a lot of different uh, geomorphic measurements for um, planning efforts. Here up is up top left is Murphy Creek, which is in a dominated forest, uh, similar to Turbo Creek. This of our gauging station in Blue Creek, and then this shot here is one of our AmeriCorps members taking a stream flow measurement in Blue Creek. Turbo Creek and Murphy Creek all have. Uh, probes, and you can see sort of these instruments. These are large turbidity booms that have on the end turbidity probes, and we are able to adjust the height of the turbidity probes to be able to take turbid water temperature measurements throughout the year. Uh, as water levels increase, you have to raise the probe to get off the bed to be able to get accurate readings. And we've been working with Redwood National Park hydrologist Randy Klein uh, to have us. Uh, you know, build these installations and to use our turbidity data and sort of sediment data to calculate sediment loads for these these streams. We follow USGS methods for flow measurements, both well and non-wayable. Send sediment samples um, using GS weightable and non-wayable methods. And to um, Operating these gauging stations and these continuous turbidity monitoring sites, we perform uh, convertebrate sampling in spring and summer. And basically, our sampling occurs under a USCP approved QA plan, and we have a macroinvertebrate sampling analysis plan that was recently revised and submitted to EA for, for approval. Uh, 2001 to 2005, we are using in the California Stream Bioassessment Protocol, our aim was to use a standard call in California to be able to compare our results across California, be able to communicate effectively with states and federal scientists. Uh, 
that goes off to Jim Harrington, who has been excellent at reaching out to tribes and engaging us and to make sure our tribal program, other tribal programs in the state of California are using, you know, methods probably. And kind of trainings in the past, we, he helped us host a training in, in Klamath in 2004, 2006, up to, um, you know, currently following the new swamp protocol. We use the IHAB method in which we are sampling 150 meter reaches and um, adopted the PHAB um, you know, measurements, which is a lot more quantitative than CS, the California Stream Bioassessment Protocol was in the past. Now I'd like to talk about our wetlands program, which is again done by Bill Patterson and was funded by EPA's uh, Wetland Program Development Funds. Uh, I started receiving those funds in 2008. There are two-year grants uh, and uh, recently awarded a, a, a grant for 2012 and 2013. So we've been mainly focusing our, in the last four years, our efforts are around the wetlands that are adjacent to the Klamath River estuary. Uh, as these wetlands are, are providing critical habitat and the survival of culturally significant species, not just fish, but plants and wildlife. Uh, in particular, the Estuaries program has discovering that they're providing habitat for coho salmon that are on the threatened list of the state and federal threatened list. And a lot of these fish are non-natal fish to these these tributaries, these wetlands that are in these tributaries. And due to some um, pit tagging efforts with Crook Tribe, discovering that there are coho inhabiting these wetlands, overwintering in these wetlands that are coming out of the Scott and Shasta rivers. So the whole area is emerging as an area in need of study. There are a lot of wetlands upstream on the reservation, and due to staffing and funding constraints, we've really focused our efforts on the wetlands adjacent to the Klamath River estuary. Um, just for the background on the estuary, um, Klamath River estuary is considered small when compared to West Coast watersheds of similar size. The Klamath River water is over 40,000 square kilometers, yet the estuary is only six square kilometers. Contrast that with the Eel River, Coquille, and other rivers that have much smaller watersheds but larger estuaries. Uh, geography constrains the limb, the size of the estuary and, and the wetlands. Others are, are bottlenecked. And some major impacts are associated to these wetlands uh, still due to roads. Operations try to dry out these wetlands to provide more uh, grazing pasture for grazing practices. Other various anthropogenic developments. It's the idea that there's a lot of recreational use, and so there's our park and homes and roads, of course, leading to each of those those properties. So the degradation of these wetlands are magnified due to the, the limited size of these wetlands and the estuary. Focusing our efforts on six wetland complexes, um, Wakel Creek, Richard Creek, the South Blue, Spruce Creek Wetland Complex, Pan Creek, and Salt Creek Wetland Complex. This is an aerial photo. Uh, the river estuary is basically defined as from the Mount Pacific Ocean up to the Wano Bridge. Salt intrusion gets to this location here, and I'm showing uh, with the with the cursor, and uh, tide fluctuations occur all the way up to this location here, which i uh, you know located at the Klamath River uh, boat ramp at Turbo. So our efforts been assessed on depressional and estuary wetland types. So in 2009, um, we began to inventory and assess these wetland conditions using the California Rapid Assessment Method, or CRAM. And the assessment data provide a way to quantify wetland degradation and allow TEP to identify the most degraded wetland areas. And what we did was we used those, that data for a restoration planning um, size in which we ranked wetlands to be, um, have, have wetland restoration prioritization based on CRAM scores, which was pretty controversial with our fisheries program. 
and um, just another piece of data that we're using to try to help plan restoration efforts. And that those results are summarized in a report that's on our website, and that's titled Klamath River Estuary Wetlands Restoration Prioritization Plan. Um, in 2010 and 2011, built on a Klamath River Estuary Wetlands Water Quality Study to characterize water quality conditions in the wetlands that are year-round, and it aims to study the effect of wetland condition on water quality, exploring the relationship, potential relationships between fish habitat and crab attributes and tricks. Uh, and it was a great um, opportunity to collaborate with our New York Tribe Fisheries, Fisheries Program uh, biologist Sarah Beasley, in which they have a good idea on the habitat that are, is provided for, for juvenile fish. And those are summarized in a report that was just completed uh, titled 2010 Klamath River Estuary Wetlands Water Quality Monitoring Report, Investigating Relationships with Cram, Water Quality, and Juvenile Sound Mounted Habitat Function. 2012 and 2013, um, we are going to uh, first study the Klamath River Estuary Wetlands and, and perform a assessment study to assess wetland condition and um, food availability for juvenile fish. We're going to work with the United States Fish Wildlife Service to update the National Wetland Inventory imagery for the reservation and lands adjacent to the reservation. And we are going to expand inv inventory and cram assessments to wetlands that are located in the upper portions of the reservation. So now what I'd like to do is sort of just touch on a lot of coordination efforts that have occurred in the Klamath River um, a lot of focus on the mainstream Klamath River and the major tributaries, and a lot of attention, and a lot of different sort of management and regulatory processes that have occurred in the last 10 years. What's that we're actively involved with is the Klamath Basin Tribal Water Quality Work Group and the Klamath Basin Monitoring Program. So again, a little bit of background on the impetus for coordination, uh, a lot of things that have happened in the last 10 years. Uh, one of the things I touched on earlier was the United States Fish and Wildlife Service Arcata Field Office was performing a Clown River Flow Study from 01 through 05, in which they were coordinating crew New York tribes to collect water samples and operate data sons. So that's sort of how we started beginning to interact with the crew tribal program. And at the same time, Pacific Corps and stakeholders were engaged in the FERC relicensing process for the Klamath Hydroelectric Project. Uh, we had hired Mike Diaz, Dr. Diaz from Watercourse Engineering, to develop a water dynamic water quality model. And what we would do is um, participate in some synoptic surveys and purified and sampling efforts to share the data for the Lower Klamath River being be incorporated into his model development efforts. At the same time, the Northwest Regional Water Quality Control Board was embarking on our Klamath River TMDL technical analysis, and we participated in a Klamath River water quality study in 2004. And I studied well. And most recently, after the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement was passed, um, we've been active with um, PCOR and working with Bureau of Reclamation, Oregon DEQ, Regional Board, EJ9, the CRI and the Yurok Tribe and, our, and various consultants to develop this comprehensive monitoring plan for public health and baseline monitoring purposes. A little bit on the Klamath Basin Tribal Water Quality Work Group is um, basically, um, as many of you may be aware, that in 2002 there was a large field the lower Klamath River where over 30,000 adult salmon died just disease, and um, the tribe wrote to EPA Region 9 administrator at the time when Ashley expressing the dissatisfaction with the lack of involvement with water quality issues in the Klamath River. I'm um, happy to say that EPA has been uh, involved since then and, and has been a, a great voice for the river to help um, support uh, water quality improvement efforts. Letter and, and this event prompted EPA to provide funding to all five tribes in the California portion of the basin to help address unmet scientific needs. And we've done a lot of things with that funding, 
2015, in 2007, the Yurok and Kruk tribes started getting funding from that funding source to pay for quality sample analysis. In 2009, Hoopa was getting some of those funds for sample analysis. In 2011 and 2012, Quartz Valley and Resagini Manteria has uh, been re are we receiving funds to expand their water quality sampling efforts. Uh, the Water Quality Work Group has a website there listed. And um, again, our creation is among the tribes is not just limited to monitoring. Uh, with that funding, we selected a highly qualified consulting firm, and that consulting firm allowed us to view and the comments for submittal to the agencies for the TL development process, the free licensing process, and now the secretarial determination process. State Water Resources Control Board's process to regulate water quality on Forest Service lands in California, the SEDS regulatory process, and a couple of years ago the Scott and Shasta River incidental take permit process. These ones also to data that we collect, analyze it, and develop technical reports. Two of which was the nutrient loading and retention dynamics and free flowing reaches that look. The um, the role that the reservoirs and river have in retaining and assimilating nutrients, and some of the results or some of the effects that we may see after dam removal. Also, a multi-year nutrient budget dynamics for Iron Gate and Copco reservoirs, and we're really trying to understand all the Klamath Hydroelectric project has in nutrient dynamics and the effects downstream. Um, the UR tribe is also heavily active in the Klamath Basin Monitoring Program, or what we call KBump a multi-agency organization which strives to implement, coordinate, and collaborate on work quality monitoring and research efforts throughout the Klamath Basin. KBOMP evolved out of a collective concern regarding water quality issues facing the basin. KBOMP offers members and interested parties a forum for constructive synthesis and coordination of water quality monitoring efforts. KBOMP members host an annual meeting aimed at addressing water quality concerns basin-wide and our last meeting was a member that was held at HSU, and um, I see some of the participants on here that, that we're at. So um, meeting, and I uh, encourage folks to get more involved and attend our meetings in the future if they're interested. So to me, a sort of, you know, we worked really hard to collect this data, manage this data, and report it, and we want to make sure it's widely available for those that are interested in it to be greatly Decide the water quality issues and to help, you know, pay a path to help improve water quality over time in the Klamath Basin. A major efforts that we've done recently uh, with Yurok and Kruk tribes is establishing a real time monitoring network for our data signs that are, uh, you know, in from May through November. And so our tributary sites uh, transmit data real time, and that information is available at our website there. Or Google your real time monitoring network as well. And um, as I was saying earlier, we had received EPA Exchange Network funds and developed a custom database, which we call the YEDS or the Yurok Environmental Data Solution System, which allows us to safely uh, store our data, but allows us to transmit our data to EPA's water quality exchange. World Wide Web allows us to meet our reporting requirements under the Clean Water Act Section 106, but allows our data to be available to a wider audience. And we also summarize our data in published reports, and those data summary reports are available on our website. I'd just like to acknowledge all the hard work from environmental program staff, you know, a lot of support from my supervisor, Dr. Kate Sloan, and AmeriCorps Watershed Stewards Project members that are currently working with us and have worked with us in the past. Um, for this EPA 9 Cleaner Water Act Section 106, EPA GAP funds the Tribal Water Quality Work Group, EPA Wetlands Program Development Grants, and Pacificor KSA Intermeasure 15 funds. So, um, just with this, 
sort of shot of the lower Klamath River. It's the lower seven miles of the Klamath River from Starwind Ridge. Um, sort of just shows a nice shot of the, the Klamath River. You the the spit separating the estuary from the ocean out here. And so just this, you know, the landscape of the lower Klamath River. Um, my contact information there if anybody would like to contact me in the future or to collaborate with us in the future. Uh, we're always, you know, sort of meeting new folks that are doing work in the basin and always interested in sharing information or our, our methods or our results to um, help us make that more meaningful. And at the time, uh, if Eric can help me, I um, want to open it up for questions and comments. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have questions, you can unmute your phone and ask Ken your questions. Questions, you can also send them to chat. We'll give them a second there. This is Kim Matz, and I, I have a question. Go for it. Uh, how are you funding? Uh, can you tell us you got the funding for that 22,000 acre purchase? You mentioned state revolving funds. Yeah, again, that was a uh, question. That's not, um, I was involved in that, even though. That big picture, you know, as far as how the tribe planned to um, get those funds, but essentially, um, PA funnels money to the state and the state of California has a state revolved fund that funds projects that are designed to improve water quality. And because that's convinced this California that it's a good use of funds, because current before the tribe took ownership of these lands, Green Diamond. And Resource Company, which is a timber company, managed the landscape intensively for timber products, uh, performed cut, um, you know, practices, and spray herbicides intensively to get their their curves growing fast. And it's basically a monoculture plantation landscape, and um, we can the state that that will manage these lands in more environmentally friendly fashion that will improve water quality over time. Ken? Uh, yeah, Fraser Schilling about UC Davis. Good, thanks. Uh, and I'm um, about to start a wide fish consumption study uh, with tribes and um, with your York and, and Crook interest in the in the study as we've as we begin as we've begun developing it, and so over the next month or two, we are going to uh, contact uh, tribes all over California to see if they're interested in in uh, working together beyond the ones that we already are working with. And and so I'd be really excited to uh, collaborate with you, work with you, and think about how that work with looking at um, fish consumption, how that could tie in to uh, water quality and and fish contamination in the basin. Yeah, um, and I, I have staff that we work with that are in a different division of our environmental program. Dr. Suzanne Fluhardy and my supervisor, Dr. Dr. Kathleen Sloan, will will definitely be active in that. Okay. And um, we'll certainly be able to provide technical information as they proceed. The tribe has been in the last two and a half years on a contamination study. Uh, um, subsistence, you know, fish, and um, various other things on, on that are related to the coastal habitat. So, um, look forward to being engaged in that process, Fraser. Great, great. Thank you. We have our additional questions. I have another question. This is Fraser Schilling again. If nobody else has a, a question, uh, and it's related to the paraphyton measurements, um, have you considered doing mass measurements? Uh, so, because I look, it seemed like you had cover and and volume chlorophyll A, but you didn't have the organic mass uh, measurement, which is another way to uh, look at nutrient effects. Yeah. So you mean like ash free dry weight? Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, it's something that we've been looking at. It's just been um, piece this project together with limited funds, and it's been a challenge. But that's been something that's been 
recommended in the past. And, uh, so it's um, thanks for putting the plug in for that, and it's something that we've been interested in adding to to our analytics. I didn't notice in there if you had uh, sent off samples for species composition for um, for the fentus or the diatom tree that you're collecting in those samples. Yeah, yeah, we you have. Okay. Um, that's we're mainly having samples um, sent off for is, is species identification and cell counts, and then um, perchlorophyll A and. Um, Scott Sinnott's got a, a draft parasite report that he, he works on and, and is trying to get out the door someday, and we hope hope he can do that, with, um, which is a long list of tasks that he has. We also, um, presented this information two years ago at the California Aquatic Bioassessment Workshop there in Davis. Okay. I think that PowerPoint should be on that, that website. You know, Jim Harrington tries to get all those PowerPoints. Yeah. So I I encourage you to look at that for a little bit more information. Okay, great, thank you. This is uh, Kim Matson. I, I, I could ask another question if you'd like. Go for it, Kim. Um, you, you, you make a, a case that um, you, the, the number of I stood on the TMDL for Klamath River, and then and it was especially comparing those photos with the, on the boat that showed it really green. Um, it makes it leaves one with the impression the Klamath River has very poor water quality, at least in your down there. Is, is that is that what you would you characterize it? How do you think the Klamath River might sit against the Rogue River and the Sacramento Rivers and and that sort? Is it is it is water quality as bad as it sort of sounds from what you're saying? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's the periods of time for the season which water quality is, is poor in the Klamath River, but it's also related. Water year type. We saw in the last two years we had abundant spring snowpack and snow melt that we saw um, lower concentrations of toxic blue green algae and toxins in the lower river. Um, you know, one thing you don't see there is, is shots or much characterization of you know, the sediment or the, the high turbidity conditions in the winter time. And so I think there are different water quality impairments at different times of the year and it fluctuates with one year type. As far as related to the Rogue and the Sacramento, um, thing I would say is that the Klamath River Basin is not as developed as the Sacramento Basin. And so I think there's sort of less industrial and urban impacts associated with the Klamath River and sort of has a higher potential for restoration, if you will, than the Sacramento. I'm going to follow up a little bit. I, I want to pursue that, how bad the Klamath is, I guess, against that photograph. Do you think it was partly to the uh, back of the draw that photo, or does it – it was really green in that with a gal in the boat. Um, given that it isn't a fairly undeveloped base, and that, that's that's a rather shocking picture, I guess. I, I didn't expect that. Um, yeah. um, do you is that a, you think it's a function of the dams largely, or uh, said you have a nutrient problem too? Will you comment on that? I think Sacramento is much cleaner than that, from what I see, at least in uh, the upper base, and I think the Rogue is too. I, I'm somewhat familiar with that river. Yeah. Now, I've done the Klamath a few times. I haven't seen it be that green, but I've seen it really pretty green up in the just below uh, Iron Gate. I've, uh, well, actually, between I can't remember. It's actually below J. C. Boyle. It's really lots of attached algae and didn't have has a pretty bad looking water quality. And, and the, the algae seems to be the most striking that I actually have noticed. I know it has a smell, and I know that fish have a uh, funny. They say it have, they have a funny taste in the river. And I watched. Indians gill net, and they seem to catch these big clots of uh, detached. Uh, I don't know what it is. If it's it's a rooted macro, maybe if it's, if it's a huge algal mats, but they get green uh, clots of uh, material on their on their on their drift nets. Yeah, um, I mean, those those photos are real, and um, the conditions that the river. As experienced, are real, and then we've tried to document and, and thoroughly 
you know, communicate those to the regulatory agencies. Um, we've done a lot of work looking at, you know, to the hydroelectric power and Copco and iron reservoirs on uh, toxic algae blooms. Really do feel that those dams are providing the habitat that is allowing those, you know, much to originosa to, to create such dense blooms. Um, Lower Klamath River has not been uh, posted since 2007 for levels of toxins below the Trinity River confluence. Last year we did have some elevated levels in the Klamath River as it entered the reservation, but as soon as the Trinity River came in, it sort of diluted it, and uh, we got uh, low cell concentration and toxin levels. And so, so you know, um, the way it's been explained to me is the Klamath River is sort of naturally nutrient-rich. Well, now it's hyper-nutrient-rich due to uh, land management effects, alterations of the marshes upstream around Upper Klamath Lake, water divisions, and um, land management practices such as logging and road building. And so um, you know, know that in the Sacramento River, they also have uh, algae blooms. I know in Diamond, well, maybe it's Diamond Lake, but I think it's um, the other, the reservoir of Pondoga has also, they've had postings for toxic algae blooms. Um, Dr. Payman has done a lot of research with toxic algae in the San Joaquin Delta and, and and, you know, the Sacramento River, and there is, you know, presence of, of bacteria and cyanotoxins as well. It's that potentially they have these reservoirs upstream that are creating these blooms, and these blooms occur for years, on, or for, excuse me, for months on end, you know. And, you know, the uh, we send down sort of ebbs and flows with the levels of uh, toxins and toxic species of algae. And so, think that, you know, on any given day, you know, summer, spring, fall, you can, you know, depending on the water you're type, and, and um, when you're out there, you can witness really different water quality conditions, and it really is um, influenced by snowpack. Good questions, Kim, and I really encourage you to stay engaged and keep asking those kind of questions, and, you know, um, looking at different various reports that are on the Water Quality Work Group's website that sort of characterize these conditions. And um, I think they're a great place that characterizes the, the water quality conditions and the role of the Klamath Hydroelectric Project is in the draft EIS EIR for the Secretary of Determination. Um, we've had extensive comments and worked with those science as they developed the record and um, really felt like, for the most part, they're accurately describing the water quality conditions. Thanks. It looks like you guys have a really uh, ambitious uh, and uh, wide-ranging water quality pro program there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's been just what developed overnight, you know, and we've got a lot of input. We've got a lot of staff that have worked on this project, you know, in the past and currently. And it's definitely attributed to, to a lot of the support from our from EPA and other federal and state partners. And partners. Ken? Yep. Now, this is Eric. Uh, so we'll let people know that they can continue to ask questions beyond 1230. We're going to stay online. We're going to keep the recording going. To ask questions, just press star six. And we do have a question that was sent in via chat. Do you have any plans to monitor for emerging contaminants? Um, yeah. So maybe hinting towards endocrine disruptors. And, um, yeah, the tribe got an EPA star, or the Yurok Tribe Environmental Program got a research grant called uh, from a funding source called EPA Star. And um, that's been the last two and a half years. And um, all the, the um, you know samples were collected, a lot of tissue sampling, and we did two rounds of water sampling, one in the fall and one in the spring of um, 2010. And all those results are sort of being QQC'd and, and being um, summarized. 
guys, and we'll be working on a report to have um, that information shared with the public here within the next year. Hey, Charlie. Yeah, I was um, I was muted and didn't know how to unmute. I was yelling at the phone. <laughs> hey, some of the questions about parafighting, and I wondered um, if uh, you in the hot year that we just had noticed any um, or have data supporting any kind of a change in biomass in algae with the uh, different flow regime. One thing we saw was biomass was lower this year when compared to past years. And so um, I think seeing that one problem that, you know, and these are sort of some of the beauty of running, running a monitoring program, um, the lab was doing parafide and chlorophyll was using the, the fluorometric method. And now we're using um, a different lab that's using the special spectrometer method. And so... Um, we really look at that stuff closely when looking at trends over time to make sure the lab analysis method isn't influencing those trends. It could influence it. Um, so I don't know, yeah. maybe you have some samples that you ran concurrently. Were you able to tell in your um, online uh, sensors? And those sensors are phycocyanin. And those are um, in the wall column, and those are designed specifically to, you know, be sensitive to accessory pigments that are associated with blue-green algae. And yeah, right. so I don't think that – I mean, we looked at that to see if there was sort of a trend with increased parafitin biomass with increased readings from phycocyanin probes. Um, typically, our parafitin is, is, you know, made of the – you know, it's like blue-green algae. There is some toxic species of benthic paraphyton that we have seen in our samples. I thought I saw that you had a chlorophyll probe, too, so I apologize. That, um, okay. 